Good morning, comic book fans. Welcome back to Comics in Five Minutes. I am your Evolving host, Shorty, and we are carrying on with our top uh, top fourteen randomly of the uh, year twenty twenty two. And this is the last one. I'm going to justify why it's slow down, basically because it's out of the top ten. Uh, once we get to the top ten, I want you just to assume that I love every single thing. Um, and the reason they're in the order they are is down to absolutely minute differences in various little substratas of quality. But there is a reason why this one isn't quite as high as it was. And we're dealing with damn them all. Um, and the reason is fairly simply, issue one came out and I absolutely adored it. It's fantastic. Issue two only just came out and I was very dubious about putting just a single issue of a miniseries in uh, without having some other quality control in there. Issue two came out and still only two th a third of the way through this miniseries. But I like it. I definitely want to put it in. I just made sure it wasn't in the top ten. That is it. Okay. Now, let's just talk about why it's great. Well, start off, it's two brilliant creators. We've got Simon Spurry, who I've talked about at length, and I'll get back into him in a little bit. But it's also Charlie Adlard. Uh, you know Charlie Adlard? That's the guy who did uh, The Walking Dead, who very rarely gets credited as a creator, even though he should do, because he's brilliant. Um, and he is absolutely on fire with this one. Once again, we are talking, like, very good human kind of stories in these things. And yes, we will get to some superhero stuff down the line, I promise we will. But his artwork style is fantastic for just people living their lives. I mean, The Walking Dead, one of the reasons I wasn't a big fan of the comic book myself is it did feel like a soap opera with zombies in the background. Um, and that's fine if that's what you want. He does a really good job of it. And it looks very down to earth and very gritty. And that's brilliant. And it suits this down to the ground. We're dealing with a very realistic version of contemporary London um, with an awful lot of archetypal characters, uh, grifters, con men, uh, cops, gangsters, criminal thieves, all these little substrata of criminality and occultism and mysticism. They're all in here, they're all represented, but what's fantastic about them is they all just look like dudes you might meet. Or when I say dudes, I do apologise. Uh, I, in my head, still have that as um, dudes meaning pretty much all people. I grew up around a Hawaiian kid when I was young, and that is a, a hangover from that. People, I meant to say people. And they are amazingly well-drawn people. These little details of characterization, which are fantastic. Their costumes are brilliant. Um, the way they sit with confidence or uh, quietness. Everything about the artwork is fantastic. And he also has massive, huge super app things going on. And here he makes an absolutely fantastic decision. I'm guessing with Spira telling you how to do this to a certain degree. But they look like they don't belong in this comic book. And I can't stress that enough. I don't mean, like, badly drawn or... Um, just like a bigger scale kind of thing. I mean, it looks like a completely different art style in a way that looks like they were created in a com for a completely different reason. And that is fantastic because it fits in entirely with the world building that's going on. Um, it suits the plot down to the ground. It makes you second guess what you're looking at. And it makes you wonder why they are looking the way they are. It makes you question things. That's good. As already discussed, we like comic books that make us question things. And all this comes down to Simon Spurrier. And here we're going to talk about Simon Spurrier for a while. One of my current favourite writers. He is absolutely fantastic. Even the little side stories he's doing in detective comics at the moment are absolutely top-notch. But the big thing we have to talk about, we're talking about, and damn them all, is his run on Hellraiser. Sorry, Hellblazer. Um, it is a fantastic run that was cruelly cancelled due to terrible marketing and the fact that it was coming out during a pandemic. But I always thought there was more he wanted to do and he's admitted he had extra stories and he kind of got told pretty late in the day that he needed to wrap it up and he had to wrap it up. And it is thoroughly unsurprising that an awful lot of people, myself included, have assumed that this is him doing an unofficial sequel. Very, very unofficial. Completely different publisher with no characters from it. But it matches. It is a fantastic, dark and gritty urban fantasy based in London with criminality um, and class and mysticism in there. It's it's absolutely everything I wanted Hellblazer to be. Um, and it's brilliant because he has a Hellblazer analogue character in this to a certain degree. I mean, it's obviously not an exact copy or anything like that, but he just murders him in the first few pages and it's fantastic. He gets a cool little intro and then it moves on to the actual main character. Um the young lady on the cover there, um, who we don't see for a good few pages because it's either from her POV or we don't know who she is. We're just getting a narration. And when we get the reveal, it's fantastic. It is just style on style on style. This is the first full shot we get of her. She's fantastic. There's been a rumour already that she's got a magic hammer, um, which has sigils engraved in it, which can send demons back to hell. You've got to claw hammer because if she's going to hit you with it, it's still a hammer. I love it. And I love the tie thing going on there as well. If you can see the detail on that. Just an extra little bit of a nod there. It's brilliant. And 
it's not just about the magic, which of course you knew I'm going to get to eventually. Uh, the best kinds of genre fiction are the ones that are about other things. We are talking about uh, power structures, um, and we're talking about um, what it takes to stay in power, and what, what you can do to increase power, and all that kind of thing, within the criminal underworld, and within society as a whole. Uh, a lot of Hellblazer stuff does reel into this a little bit, with uh, his view on politicians and the like. I think the Hellblade stuff is definitely more punk than this, but we do still have um, a lot of major societal issues in this one. As I say, we've got police officers and addicts, and we've got the way various things are looked at through a societal lens, all of which is fantastic, and none of which takes away from the fact that this is also a story about demons um, and how to deal with them. Uh, literal demons, not just, or, um, you know, the, the metaphysical kind of idea that, uh, or metaphorical idea that uh, people with demons are uh, people just struggling. No, literal demons. Um, and all this is fantastic as well because we have an almost Hickman-esque way of uh, adding extra information in the terms of pages full of information. It's all in character though, uh, in world specifically there is a, a the uh, previously uh, mentioned uh, dead Constantine uh, character who has a diary which we get pages from which means it's all in his vernacular, it isn't just dry in any way shape or form and it does add something. There's also quite a lot of exposition in this book done in ways which work weirdly well for me because there's a lot of negative space between panels in the guttering which are quite large and there's an awful lot of text being put into them this could slow it down but for me it just reads as i'm now here some stuff keep going keep going keep going if it's really important people will talk about it if not just read it and then carry on with your day and it doesn't slow anything down which is good because this is kind of a slow burn comic book you put anything extra in um, it could become a bit glacial in its pace but it doesn't all it does is just build up more and more and more and the first three pages of issue two are some of the best writing, some of the most exciting things that happen in pretty much any other comic book I've read recently. I think um, there's one that's not quite out enough to make it into this year's list called All Against All, which has like comparative kind of things, where it's not necessarily the biggest, most over-the-top action sequences, but just some absolutely gorgeous emotional writing which drags you into the story without any warning and then kicks you hard when you're not expecting it. It's brilliant writing, it's brilliant art, the world is fantastic and I want more of this world to carry on. Boom Studios have a tendency every once in a while to put out little mini-series like this, see how they sell and then maybe carry on doing them for a while, once in future being my primary example of this one. I really hope that this is selling as well as it deserves to and I really hope that they let Spuria and Adlab carry on making it because I think this could be one of those huge epic stories with fantastic characters and a wonderful world that I'm going to want to keep reading for many, many years. It is spectacular. Uh, but that's it for me for now. I've got the top 10 starting next, well, for the rest of the week, and held them towards Christmas Eve. If you want to make sure you don't miss anything, uh, hit the like, subscribe, uh, notification, share, follow, whatever button you need to press on any kind of social media you're seeing this, and you will get, hopefully, a notification so you don't miss anything out. Until I am back, though, look after each other, everyone. Stay safe. Bye.